Greetings, I'm Eric Prince, and this is Off Leash. With me today is Jack Wheeler. Uh, we're continuing our conversation. He's just been talking about uh, his life of adventure. He is the closest thing to the real life Indiana Jones I've ever met. Um, so Jack, welcome. Um, Great being here. T- tell me, uh, we first talked about your amazing childhood and formation. Now tell me, how did you ever meet Ronald Reagan when was it? How did you get involved in his uh, in his life and uh, and in his mission as well? Well, I was a senior at UCLA in 1965, and I would be graduating that next uh, January. It was October of 1965, and there was all this talk at the time about Ronald Reagan. Uh, running for governor because of the role that he played in the Goldwater campaign the year before and the extraordinary speeches that he gave uh, for Goldwater. Everybody uh, started talking to him about running for governor. And so he gave a speech at UCLA. And um, a friend of mine and I, of course, went into the student union. Those days, everybody's very respectful, uh, et cetera. And... Um, uh, we're, I'm sitting there with my friend, Bill, Bill Anthony, and uh, uh, he was talking, and then he said, you know, this whole left-right political spectrum, left communists, right fascists, Nazis, it makes no sense to me. I, I don't, it makes no sense. Uh, for me, my political spectrum is up and down, up and down, uh, up towards individual freedom and a government that protects individual freedom and their rights. And at the bottom of my scale is everything that's totalitarian, that's control of the individual by the state, whether that's communism or Nazism, Marxism, fascism, it's all forms of totalitarianism. That's my, that's my, my political spectrum. And I'm an advocate of individual freedom up and down. And so I turned to my friend, Bill, and I said, that settles that. And he says, settles what? And I said, that's what I've always wanted somebody to say. I mean, Nazis and communists and fascists, and it's all the same thing. Sure. I mean, Nazis are national socialists. It's not, yeah, because in German, it's national socialistische. The word Nazi comes from the German pronunciation of national. Nazi, national, Nazi, now socialist, national socialist, whereas Marx and communists are international socialists. Okay? And so uh, for Hitler, everything was the race, the Aryan race. For Marx, it was the workers, which are international, and that's the cause, the, the, the tussle between them. But at any rate, so uh, as I Mentioned uh, in the, in the, uh, our, our talk before, my father uh, was a television producer and had his own shows and a local uh, television station in Los Angeles, and he knew everybody, uh, everybody in show business he knew. So I, I came home um, that weekend, and I said, Dad, you know Ronald Reagan, don't you? And he said, yeah, I mean... I mean, Reagan is not this, this you know, icon. He was an actor, and, and he was on Death Valley Days and GE Theater and stuff like that. And at any rate, um, he said, sure. And, and so I said, well, do you think I could meet him? Now, I'd never asked to meet anybody before. My father, I grew up with people like Frank Sinatra and Bob Hope and Red Skelton. These are all friends, and, and, and I never asked to meet anybody. John Wayne, you know, um, it, you know it, it was part of you know, my father's life. And so uh, he said, well, you know, okay, so fine, sure. He wrote the book, he calls him over and said, uh, Ron, this is Jackson, Jackson Wheeler. 
And uh, Jackson, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. It's my, my son, he's, he's a student at UCLA, and he heard your speech, and he was really impressed by it. And uh, he, he'd like to meet you if that's possible. And Reagan said, well, sure, come on over. <laughs> this is Saturday. He said, come on over. <laughs> so my father got in the car, and we drove over to Pacific Palisades. And there he is. He had an aide, but Nancy was not there. And um, we're in his, his den. And uh, I'm sitting, in, my dad and I are sitting in bar stools in the bar, and, and he's in an easy chair. And he starts talking, and I completely forget what he said. I, I can't remember. But, but I remember he put his hands up and he said, when he done, he says, and that's the way I feel. And I said, well, Mr. Reagan, that's exactly how I feel. And, and again, which is one of these things, like I heard myself tell my dad I wanted to climb the Matterhorn. I'm hearing myself saying without any forethought, uh, if you're going to run for governor, Mr. Reagan, and if there's anything I could do to help, I would do it. What is this? Some kid. I'm 20, right. 20 years, 20 years old, and, and I'm <laughs> a kid at UCLA. What? So at any rate, a couple of weeks later, I got a telephone call from a guy named uh, Stu Spencer. And he says, uh, uh, Jack, uh, uh, this is Stu Spencer. My company is Spencer & Roberts. Uh, we're political consultants, and we've been hired by Mr. Reagan to organize his campaign for governor, and we'd like to talk to you. And so I said, sure. So we came down, you know, they'd have an office there in Wilshire Boulevard, and he ended up offering me a job to work for the campaign for $600 a month, which wasn't bad in 19, bad. what's this, what's, what's this, 1980, right? No, no, you running for governor, yeah. 60. No, 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 my gosh, no, what am I thinking? Thinking brain lock, brain lock. Uh, this was in 19, well, yeah, 1965. That's right, October. It was October 1965. And, and, so, uh, so, so Reagan runs. So I accepted. <laughs> and, and he won one term or two terms? Uh, he won two terms, but I just worked in that campaign. When when he got elected governor, you know, I I, I had a I, I had a business to tell you the truth. I was graduating from UCLA, but I already had a business exporting cinnamon from South Vietnam, and I had to, I had things to do. So so, so I don't want to be in politics. You, you I don't were want to be in politics. Exporting cinnamon during the Vietnam War. That's right. Awesome. Yeah. So <laughs> so at any rate, at any rate. The point is here is that I am state chairman of Youth for Reagan. And so there's all these kids. And we became, we just really bonded. And we are bonded to this day. It gives you an idea all these years since, uh, six, over 60 years, that we're still friends. And so um, uh, now I go and, uh, well, actually, you know, I, when you talk about running a business in Vietnam, <laughs> they they blew up our cinnamon groves and they killed my Vietnamese partner and, you know, et cetera. And I said, not a good idea. So I ended up uh, broke in Hawaii and um, I'd started reading Ayn Rand and I'd started reading Ludwig von Mises and I started really getting interested in philosophy and I decided well, if I'm ever going to really learn how to think straight, it's going to be now. And so I ended up uh, working towards a PhD in philosophy. And uh, so that's how I spent the 70s. But then each summer I'd go someplace and have an adventure. That's another story. And and uh, at any rate. So that's interesting. Uh, so would your, would your adventure travel business pay for your school year then? No, 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 no. It's just uh, I was teaching. No, no, no. Okay. But, uh, no, by then, by now, I am at uh, USC and a TA and an instructor, and I'm getting paid. And so I've got something, a little stipend to go on and save it all up. And every summer, I just take off, you know, and there's no something spectacular. hotels out in the Amazon, you know. So, right. so, uh, so at any rate, that's how I spent the 70s. 
uh, and now Ronald Reagan gets elected president of the United States. And I have been in touch, and we have been friends, get together with all the guys that was in Youth for Reagan, and now a number of those kids in 1966 are now in the White House with the president of the United States. And one of them was our buddy, Dana Rohrabacher. And so yep. at that time, so Dana is one of the chief speech writers for President Reagan. And uh, Dana and I um, have bonded for many, many years. And so one, one, um, one day, um, Dana and I are talking on the phone. I'm living at that time now in Malibu, California. And uh, I say, Dana, do you know that map of mine? It's actually right behind me right now. Uh, that has all those lines on it where I've been in the world, you know. And he says, yeah, yeah. And I said, the map looks different to me. And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, Dana, I'm looking at things and I'm seeing a different world. I said, you know how in the 50s and 60s and the 70s, whenever we hear of some liberation movement, there's always some commie thing that was in some Western country out there in the third world that the Soviets or the Chinese are trying to overthrow. And uh, whether it's Angola or Mozambique or, of course, Cuba and wherever. Um, well, the map has changed, man. I am seeing anti-communist, anti-Marxist guerrilla movements all over now. Now, you know one of them, because it, it already had started in, in Nicaragua, the Congress. But I'm, and, and something's happening in Afghanistan, but I also see stuff in Angola, Mozambique, stuff I haven't really heard of yet, but I know what's going on and I see something. And Dana says, well, all right. Well, nobody here, meaning the White House, has ever said anything like that anywhere, anytime. Prove it. What are you going to do? Okay, it's a nice idea, Jack. And I said, you know, I'll be right back. <laughs> so, hold my beer. <laughs> hold my beer. <laughs> so, so um, uh, I got uh, actually as a, a donation from the Reason Foundation, and really? and I okay. yeah yeah uh, Bob Poole, a Tibor McCann at the Reason Foundation, and um, uh, I was I was out there. And uh, trying to figure this out. And so um, the really the turning moment, uh, because I got into, I got down there with the Contras and um, in Nicaragua and we got a big firefight and it was an interesting experience. But then um, I am now in Afghanistan and I know there's the people among the Mujahideen who do most of the fighting is a, is a group called the Jamiat. And, um, uh, so I know they're based in Peshawar. That's about it. So I, I, um, I know there's a guy that, that speaks English, uh, one of them. And so, so I find out in Peshawar where, they're, where the office is, and I go and, I, and there's a guy with an AK that's standing there, and I, and I say, Engineer uh, uh, Abdul Rahim. And he says, Engineer Rahim. Engineer Rahim Chitral. I said, of caravanserai way up in the Hindu Kush. I said, okay, I got to get there. So I get in a bus and I go all the way up there. And I find out where they are. And so here's their kind of little fortress thing. And now we're right next to the border up in the Hindu Kush with Afghanistan. And 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 so out comes this guy. And he says, I'm Rakeem. And I said, howdy, my name is Jack Wheeler. I'd like to talk to you. And I said, what do you want? To do? Why are you here? What are you doing? And so we're we're standing on the edge of this this, this uh, ravine with the river, and there's there's Tirik Mir, twenty five thousand foot mountain right up there, and uh, and I said, well, he said, well, what do you what do you want? Why are you here? And I said, well, I I'm studying people who are fighting the Soviets all over the world. Fascinating. And he looked at me and he said, what? 
And I said, well, why are you fighting? I mean, the Soviets, they have their army here and they've taken over your country, you know, and you're fighting to get your country back. He said, you know, what, what, what's what we're doing? I said, well, the Soviets... Afghanistan is not the only colony the Soviets have. They have colonies all over the world. They have an empire. And in some of those colonies, parts of their empire, they are fighting the same fight as you are. And he says, really? I said, yeah. I mean, he didn't even, never even heard of Nicaragua, much less Mozambique or Ethiopia or Cambodia or whatever the heck, you know? So, so really tell me about that. Now, all of a sudden I'm interesting to him. And finally he says, well, what do you want? And I said, I want you to take me inside. I want you to take me inside, <clears throat> you know? So I want to see what you're fighting, what you're doing. And so I can go back and tell people the United States. And he says, Okay, so, <laughs> so off I went. <laughs> and, and, uh, that was my first time in Afghanistan. I went in, I mean, you know, Eric, you know Afghanistan better than me, but, but, but back in then, this is 1983, and, and so, uh, et cetera. So I went, you know, I was gone six so months. Do you, do you think, yeah. do you think uh, Rahim had had any other contact with Americans before then? He never told me. Yeah, he never he never told me. It sounds um, like you had first contact there as well. Yeah, so <laughs> so at any rate, um, I get back to Washington, and Dana has arranged a meeting for me. This is November of eighty three, and he's arranged a meeting for, uh, with me, uh, with uh, with uh, people in the West Wing and National Security Council and uh, uh, the agency and etc. and and so I showed him all these slides that I'd taken. And actually, they're slides that I like had sent. Literally an old-fashioned slide, like the old... Um, That's right. Um, That's right. Yeah. Plastic 30 pieces 30, 30, 30 with a slide millimeter. This is right. long before it's slide projects. Oh, gosh. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I'd never even seen these pictures. Because they were, we just threw them together in one of these carousels and, and put them because I'd never seen them. I landed there. He picked me up at the airport, drove me to the White House, and we had the meeting. And I've been gone six months, and I never seen these pictures before. I'd sent them by diplomatic pouch because I could do that uh, to Dana to get them processed, and that was it. And I explained each, but each picture had a story. Each, yeah. uh, you know, this is Rick, uh, uh, this is uh, Amin, and he's a young boy, and he's got two stumps on the end of his ha uh, uh, arms, and he's just, yeah. his hands were blown off by a toy butterfly bomb toy bomb made by the Soviets and blow people up. And I told him stories. And, and I said, here's the situation, is that we, my proposal is that is there really is an emerging global guerrilla war, series of global uh, guerrilla wars that are anti-Soviet and anti-Marxist. They want freedom from communism. And if we support the phenomenon of resistance to Soviet imperialism, not just we want freedom for Nicaragua or Afghanistan, which is a good but approximate goal, but our goal should make a structural assault on the empire, an assault on the very structure of the Soviet empire, so it collapses in upon itself, implodes in upon itself, so the Soviet yeah. Union stopped like, being like a Reagan's, threat like to Reagan's us. Like Reagan's speech, you wanted people up, not down. That's right. More human yeah. freedom, not less. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, um, at any rate, uh, I, I that was the birth of the, what people call the Reagan doctrine. We never called it the Reagan doctrine, um, uh, but uh, it was by um, Charles Krauthammer. He figured it out and by, by 1985, he figured it out, and he gave it a name, uh, wrote an essay in Time Magazine, The Reagan Doctrine. We never called it that. And, uh, and it was, but, but, but again, that, that doctrine, that approach was not to, it was not all military, it was not all guns, it was economic, political, cultural, social, all the, all the areas of society to promote human freedom, not less of it. 
Uh, that is certainly true. My role was being uh, President Reagan, I ended up being President's liaison, unofficial liaison, because I never worked for the White House, uh, but his liaison between these different groups to him and the, and the White House, and like Bill Casey or somebody like that, um, and people on the National Security Council. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. It ended up um, being... Uh, uh, much more com- much more comprehensive. Michael Ledeen, who, whom we both know, um, yep. uh, he was in charge of the program that defined um, the, the what what is strategic or, or tra- there's a term for it you remember, but but um, what what we could not export to the Soviet Union and. Jimmy Carter, it was like Biden's open borders. It was anything the Soviets wanted. Ledeen just shut that one down. So there was no technology anymore that that the Soviets could get their hands on. Ronald Reagan, in um, uh, I believe it was 85, uh, he had a meeting with uh, the king of Saudi Arabia's King Fahd at the time. And the meeting went something like this in the White House. Um, um, the king, uh, Mr. President, uh, what do you want from us? Reagan, Mr. King, your highness, I want you to crash oil prices. King said, why, why do you want us to do that? We're making all this money. And sure, you wanted to squeeze the Soviets. Reagan says, "Well, yes, you're making money, but the point is, your main uh, competitor is the Soviet Union, and they're producing more oil than you. Why? Because prices are so high, and they can afford to do that. But the thing is, is that it costs them many, many dollars to get every barrel of oil out of their frozen land." Whereas it comes out of the sand for you at 20 cents a barrel. So if you crashed oil prices, it would, the Soviets could not sell their oil because they'd be losing so much money. So that would enable you to increase your market share by they would buy oil from you rather than the Soviets, and you'd make more money than ever. And Fod turns to an aide and says, who the hell told me that this man is dumb? That's genius. <laughs> right. We got a deal. And so it crashed oil prices. So what we did with the Reagan doctrine in, um, uh, uh, in supporting all of these anti-Soviet insurgency from Angola to Mozambique, to well, not Mozambique, it's another story, but... Um, Nicaragua, Ethiopia, Angola. Afghanistan, Angola, etc. Why that race, it's a lot more expensive to fund an army than it is to fund a guerrilla army, right? Exactly. And so, and, 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 so, and that's the important, Jack, I, I, that's the important distinction I want you to, to clarify. Yeah. This was not a huge DOD program confronting the Soviets. It was not spending yeah, more money on aircraft per, carriers. You're precisely correct. This it's is more on the, on the cheap, to pennies on the dollar. RPGs, AKs, ammo, uh, et, et cetera, that is on the cheap and not one single American life. No, nobody. And, but, but, the, but, but the other thing no is soldiers. It was spec- right. But it was this, the spectrum of pushback. Because right. I know Reagan spent a lot more on the U.S. Information Agency and the Voice of America right. and, the, and, and radio broadcasts That's right. into areas that where the, the Soviets, the communists, were trying to, to shut off communication. There was right. um, a lot more cultural exchanges. Hell, there was even, um, you know, again, the full spectrum of government from trade, as you're talking about, whether it's uh, going at oil, cutting off their technology, um, pushing back on the periphery and, and supporting insurgents that didn't like them to, to helping people understand better governance. That was the, that was the, the crux of the Reagan doctrine was pushing back. Um, That's right. Yeah, and so it was, it was a full, full court press. 
You're right. Because, so, and I think it's important. When, when Reagan was mm-hmm. elected, we'd just gone through a horrific time in the 70s. Vietnam collapse. Ro- uh, helicopters off the rooftop of the embassy in Saigon. Uh, Iran hostage crisis. Nicaragua tips over the commies. Angola tips over the commies. Um, the, there's just a big... Um, and Watergate. Uh, Remember, and Watergate. Nixon, and, and, that and, and that and terrible so- scandal. And the Soviets were just seemed to be advancing and winning everywhere, whether everywhere. it's the Olympics, whether it's they were they were they were pressing. And the U.S. was and, and I remember Jimmy Carter. I was a little kid. I think he actually got on TV in a sweater and saying, encouraging people to turn their thermostats down to save energy. That's right. That's right. Well, we kind of have the same thing today, you know. Yeah, and, and that's, well, no, and that's, that's my me. point, and that's why I, I think <laughs> that's why it's important to have this conversation. And so we'll close off this segment. Thank you, Jack, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes, and we'll talk about what we should do next. Okay. 